Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for coming today to the Authors at Google event in the San Francisco office. Today, we're very pleased to have Matt Rickstill join us. He is currently a, a journalist, or I should say he makes most of his living, as he says, as a journalist for the New York Times. Um, but this is his first work of fiction. It's called Hooked. And this is the paperback that just was released last week. Um, in addition to being a journalist, Matt is also, a, I guess, a constant creator would be the best title. Uh, he has a cartoon um, that he publishes. And he's currently also working on the second or the fall, I don't know if it's the follow-up per se, but his second novel, which is called Idol's Mind, or tentatively called. Um, Matt is a local. He lives in San Francisco. He's a Cal graduate, undergrad, and he went to Columbia School for his master's in journalism. And please join me in welcoming to the authors at Google program, Matt Richtel. Nick, you've absconded with my book that I'm reading from. It was a test. <laughs> um, hello. Um, first, I, I got to thank you guys for coming out to a first-time author. I know you get uh, you get a lot of fancy pants, big-name authors. I'll I'll tell you what it's like to be a first-time author. I had a friend when this came out in hardback. <clears throat> He went down to it was Barnes and Noble or Borders, and he was looking for the book, and he saw it on one of the front tables, and he was, you know, he was excited. He pulled out his cell phone camera, and uh, he started to take a picture of it. And the the person working at the store came over and said, uh, "What are you doing?" He said, uh, "My my book was sitting between a Superman anthology and a Martha Stewart book." He said, I, "I'm taking a picture of my friend's." book and the person working there said oh my god are you serious you know Martha Stewart <laughs> so that is uh, that's a little bit what it's like to be a first timer and so thank you for uh, coming out I appreciate all the support I'm gonna do um, this is a little bit of a reading and a little bit of a conversation and the reading part of it is actually the least uh, I think is the least comfortable for me because we lose contact with each other but to give you a sense of the book and what it's about, I thought I would read the first page and a half. It sort of speaks to why I wrote the book, which is something I never really intended to do. I mean, I never intended to write a book. I'm a, I'm a journalist and a cartoonist. Long for me is a thousand words. So a uh, hundred thousand words seemed, you know, mildly crazy, um, which it turns out to be. Uh, but I'll, I'll read you the first page and a half, and it'll give you a sense of why I did this and what drove me to it, and then maybe I'll read a few other bits and pieces, and then let, maybe we can have a conversation. If you guys didn't bring questions or I don't inspire any, I brought some for you. So uh, we, can we can assign them or pick them out of a hat. Okay, this is called Hooked, a thriller about love and other addictions. And this is the beginning of chapter one. <clears throat> I'm guessing that the moment that your life begins to unravel is often unceremonious, heralded by a whimper. The bang should have told me something. I remember mostly details. The extra foam sliding down the side of the mocha, a couple arguing over whether to put the mighty OJ juicer on their bridal registry, the Rottweiler tied outside the cafe, standing on hind legs, paws pressed urgently against the window. When she walked by, I was reading a languid description of a Boston River, somewhat guiltily speeding through the imagery to get back to the book's action. I wouldn't have noticed her at all had she not put a small, folded square of paper on the corner of my table. I registered graceful hands and a ring on the index finger. Then I focused on the piece of paper. Was I being picked up? When I looked up again, she was nearly out the screen door, purposeful and not stopping to look back. I dog-eared a page in my book, picked up the folded note and followed her. I scanned the street. The young transplants who call San Francisco's Marina District home meandered with designer sunglasses and designer baby strollers, enjoying a fogless July afternoon. Through the crowd, I could see she was halfway into a red sob parked in front of the pita parlor. Something kept me from calling out. I figured I'd wave her down, but she was in the car and pulling away before I could get close enough to yell without making a scene. I looked at the textured beige stationery in my palm. I unfolded the corners and saw words like a bullhorn. Get out of the cafe, now! 
the cafe exploded. Smoke, car alarms, glass, ashe glass ashes, a cloud of dust, a sound inside my head like a hangover delivered via freight train. I don't think I ever lost consciousness. The blast took me three feet through the air, dropped me on the pavement, but seemed to leave me intact. These days, you imagine the first thought at such a moment would be of terrorism. My first thought was of Annie. She was rarely from my mind even four years after the accident that took her, her life at the age of 28. Mostly I'd thought of her at moments of transition, when I got up, climbed into bed, or on a long drive between interviews. It said as much about me as us. It was in those moments, the quiet instances when life lacked structure, that I most needed a place to focus. I wouldn't defend my relationship with Annie as perfect, but it defined love for me and endured. She was always chewing strong breath, mint, breath mints, causing our kisses to taste spicy, and I got sad when I smelled cinnamon. Sometimes at night, I told an imaginary Annie stories aloud and tried to guess at which point she would have sleepily asked me to wrap it up. But it was more than longing that made me think of her as a thin layer of dust settled over me. It was the note I'd been handed. I'd know Annie's handwriting anywhere. Ooh. <laughs> Can I get an ooh? All right. Uh, <clears throat> so it's Google. It's interactive. Um, that is, uh, I, I sat down and I wrote that sitting, I think, at a cafe, or that's the mythology that I've let myself believe in probably 2003. And as I said, I didn't intend to write a book, but I was... Um, I was consumed. I was I was muse bit, and I wanted to know what happened in the cafe, and I wanted to know what happened to the ex girlfriend, and I started writing at a torrid pace. And five months later was the first draft of this. That while it went through numerous iterations, more than I could possibly, I, I can't remember, the skeleton remained the same. So if you hear, if you are one of those people who has been muse bit gang tackled by muses or if you know of people who tell you that or if you know people who tell you that's happened it really can happen it's really powerful and not only do they gang tackle you they then proceed to wake you up at six in the clock every morning and say start typing so um i i want to i actually want to read a little bit more before we get into a conversation the reason being that i had a i had a, a terrific editor and who typically writes, who typically edits nonfiction. He did the likes of Seabiscuit and The Orchid Thief. And one thing he said to me, or we concluded together, is that when you write a thriller, it's really hard for people to suspend disbelief. Um, something fantastical happens on the first page, like a cafe exploding and someone perhaps coming back from the dead that has written the, the warning note. And how do you keep people from how do you keep people feeling like there's some real substance there or there might be um, a reason to keep reading beyond the fantastical? And the answer is that you've got to hew it to reality as much as possible. You've got to ground it in a time or a place. I don't know how many of you guys read thrillers or mysteries. Many of the good ones have a great legal background in them or they're set in Stalinist Russia, or they're set in a time and place. They're very environmental. They're of and about a place, and so they hew very closely to reality, and it makes it easier as the reader to suspend disbelief for the more fantastical pieces. What he said to me was, you've got a unique, unusual, not a unique position, but unusual position. You're a New York Times reporter. You're based out there. The story's based out here. I want to see the pieces of Silicon Valley come to life in an organic, real way, and that was one piece of grounding this. The other piece is, he said, no cliches, ever. You've got to make an observation about Silicon Valley or about a person that other people haven't made before. So one example that he particularly liked is that, um, and that I, I, I liked, is that, um, let me see if I can find it. <clears throat> I'm just going to read through the book in its entirety. When I find the spots, I'll come back to them. I've got this written down. <laughs> Go about your business. Invent a search technology. Um, let's see. Well, 
Well, I'll tell you what it is, because I have some other spots I want to read. I'm, at one point, I made the observation that everyone is on time in Silicon Valley, but no one owns a watch. And everyone wants to act like they're so cavalier. I don't really need to know what time it is. That's why I don't own a watch. I'm working on my own time. I'm being creative. But the truth is we have 18 clocks on us at any given time because we've got our PDAs and our Blackberries and so on and so forth. These were the kinds of observations he wanted. And here was another, um, there's a scene that kind of uh, summed up the way he wanted this written about, which was something not cliche, but also grounded in the area. Story moves very quickly. Our hero goes on a hunt for what's happened, and it leads him to the, the, um, graves, the graves in Colma. The paper said Simon Anderson's funeral and memorial service would be held graveside in Colma, the city of souls. More than one million people are buried in cemeteries on a lush hillside setting just south of San Francisco. The only thing more crowded than life in the Bay Area is the afterlife. The obituary said the deceased was a former investment banker focusing on technology who'd done well enough to take on his dream of becoming a writer. He'd published a children's book through a vanity press. A crowd was gathering. A woman next to me pulled out a bottled water and a pouch of raw mixed nuts. She told her friend she'd brought her own snacks in case the funeral food wasn't organic. A tent had been set up over the gravesite, and a woman I took to be Anderson's wife sat underneath with her daughter and autistic son, who bounced excitedly, seemingly oblivious to the solemnity. Surrounding us were, the to were tombstones big and small, deaths, haves, and have-nots. The silver family mausoleum was big enough to fetch 3000 a month without renovations if rented as a one-bedroom apartment in Noe Valley. So this is the way we tried to mix, to ground this in hopefully a non-cliche way in, in the Bay Area. And I'll just give you one more um, character-based example. Um, <clears throat> there's a character named Aaron who, should you read this? I hope you read this. You'll get to know. Um, and she'd come to the Bay Area after being in Michigan. Um, and uh, the segue is not going to make complete sense here, but let's just go with it. Um, she moved west. She tried to figure out if there had been some impulse or interest she'd been repressing, like a lot of other people. Haight Ashbury may have turned into a veritable had, may have turned into a veritable outdoor trinket mall, but some people still flocked to San Francisco to find themselves. There were far more southern and midwestern black sheep than you could squeeze into a VW microbus. They were part of the to-do list generation, people who got into new thing after new thing, from rock climbing to hot yoga to night golf, sometimes in the same day. And sometimes it seemed they didn't really pause to enjoy the thing, they just liked marking it off the list. So again, tried to make some observations about the place and the people, um, and you can see none of them are cynical in the slightest. Um, I want to pause here to see if, before I tell you a little bit about the conspiracy in this book, and I'm not sure how much I'm going to tell you, um, but uh, any thoughts or questions, observations? Uh, anybody else like to read from their book? Uh, very egalitarian. Sharon, as a quick reminder, just speak into the mic so we can capture it on YouTube. Hey, Matt. Um, I'm wondering if, as you're as you were going through this process of writing, and you're also doing your reporting, how much cross pollination of ideas there was. Um, I could see for sure that what you're reporting would influence what gets into the book because that's you're kind of tracking trends in Silicon Valley and and especially cultural trends around here. Um, but is, did it go the other way also, where ideas you came up with as you're developing the, the narrative in the, in the novel influenced what kind of stories you chased in real life? Yeah, let me, um, let me address that on, great question. Uh, it, was, it is a great question. Let me address it on substance and, um, and process. Let me start with process. 
I was surprised how much process of nonfiction writing lends itself to fiction writing. First way is, as a nonfiction writer for the paper, I write probably twice a week a thousand words. The upshot of that is, one, my writing muscle is very well developed. So I could sit down if I only had an hour, an hour and a half, and an idea that I wanted to express here and do it very quickly. The other thing that writing all the time as a journalist lets you do is um, it gets you over the fear of failure. Come six o'clock East Coast time, my story has to be filed. So no matter, you know, if I had a rough night, if, uh, you know, I, the, the story's still coming together, um, if my writing chops aren't on that day, I still got to get it done. So I've learned to write and let go. So as a, matter of, as a matter of process, that was hugely helpful in that I could get over the writer's block hump that paralyzed so many people. I know as a matter of course, I've got to get things written and done. The other thing as a matter of process that helped is, as a journalist, much more than I think I realized, and much more than journalism lets you communicate in a paper, I am constantly making observations. So-and-so wore a green shirt. So-and-so had sad eyes. So-and-so's face was um, inconsistent with what their mouth was saying. I mean, these are things that don't lend themselves to a newspaper, but that lend themselves to the way you observe the world. So all this information was storing up inside me. As a matter of substance, I wrote this first, um, I wrote this first few pages, and then I wrote 30 more pages rapidly without really knowing where the story was going. And I happened to have a, a friend who's a prolific and fantastic screenwriter. And I was, I was talking to him about it, and he read the first 30 pages, and he said, um, he said, do you know, do you know where this is going? Because you shouldn't stop. And, and I was kind of paused at that point, the first and only time I really paused in the book. And I said, ah, I don't know. I'm not sure. And he has a very fine sense of fiction um, arc and narrative arc. And he said, I think this book, the seeds of what happened at that cafe end at that cafe. Whatever happened there is your whole story. And like Pick your metaphor, lightning, thunder, uh, whatever it is, something much better than that, I hope, is uh, um, I was struck by an idea that I had been gestating as a journalist for about four years that I didn't really have a place for. And it was uh, the seeds of a sp the sprawling conspiracy that are in this book, and I don't want to give that away, but I'll tell you a little bit about um, the ideas that were floating around for me that wound up getting channeled into the conspiracy. And it has to do with what is happening to our brains by virtue of our constant interaction with technology. Um, the broadest metaphor I'll use, and this is not in the book, but the broadest metaphor I'll use is when we were in a jungle, our bodies adapted. We brachiated and we learned to walk upright or we we walked upright and we had we changed it seems to me inconceivable that we're not changing by virtue of the fact that we now have a chrome and glass and and uh you know neon jungle that we are spending all day with we must be changing surely that's not happening over the course of uh a decade or the a dot com and bubble and bust and bubble again and but it's happening to us that was the seeds of it the other thing the other seeds on a very personal note that i noticed was um something that i will call here this is the arguably the worst ever contribution to western philosophy the cell phone orthodontist principle this states you're in your car you've called everyone that you can possibly think of. Some of them you got on the phone, some of them aren't around, you're still bored, you got that jittery feeling. My theory, the cell phone orthodontist principle states that eventually you'll look up the phone number for uh, the person, your orthodontist from junior high. He'll answer the phone, you'll say, he'll say, who is this? You'll say, I love what you did with my teeth, are you busy for the next 40 miles? And I noticed in myself, that I was having a, I was having, what, you, none of you had orthodont, you all had perfect teeth? No, we all had orthodont. 
can't imagine talking to them. <laughs> oh, it'll get. So I was on I I, I was on a uh, a radio show WGN in Chicago, t- and I told that story. And the host had people call in with their own stories about what had been the most uh, perverse or unusual time that they had used their cell phone in a car. And a woman called up and she said she couldn't find anyone to call. She eventually called um, the Butterball Turkey Hotline (laughs) and had a conversation with an operator there. So uh, if anyone anyone want to share a story? Um, So I I noticed in myself um, these, I noticed on a, a grand level that technology was changing the way we behave and interact and Personally, um, it was cha- it was changing the way. It was. T- I, I felt I felt it was. I was getting. I was experiencing addiction. I was experiencing an adrenaline rush when I used technology, and I was experiencing boredom in its absence. And there's even a term for that now. Some Harvard psychiatrists have come up with called acquired attention deficit disorder. The theorem is the 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 um, what it means is. You get a little adrenaline rush every time you answer your phone or answer your email. You get a dopamine squirt, is the way they put it. And in its absence, you go seeking it out. That's a physiological explanation. Uh, um, An emotional explanation might be that when you open your email, when it pings, you get kind of random reinforcement. A lot of the time it's, would you like to give to Zimbabwe and make a million dollars or some friend passing along a joke? But occasionally, it's something really good. So you learn to constantly check your email, your phone. You get rewarded. These are the seeds of some of the substance. A bit of a long-winded answer, Jason. But um, in short, what I was covering gave me an opportunity to write about something that I might, in a forum that I might otherwise not be able to write about. So other questions? What about the, the other in the other way? Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was trying to deftly, uh, evade that because I'm not, I'm, I haven't thought about it before. So in other words, did writing fiction give me some ideas? Um, either subject or process, did it, you know, influence? it has, it has with the second book. The second book is called, um, yes, it has. The second book is called Idol's Mind and, the book has to do, the main character in this is called Nat Idol. The, the basic elevator pitch is there's a grandson, this main character, and a grandmother who are pretty close. The grandmother knows a very terrible secret, a world-changing secret, but she has dementia, and she doesn't know what it is. And the main character, in the course of coming of age himself, has to pull that secret out of his her head. And when I started thinking about that as a neat idea, I started looking into what's happening to our memories today. And there's interesting um, interactions. In fact, you may have seen this month, the cover story in the Atlantic is called, Is Google Making Us Stupid? And it's about, more broadly, what is the internet doing to our brains? So in that respect, yes, it's causing me to kind of a, a fast a fantastical idea is inspiring me to look at what the more substantive stories might be. I have a question about the writing process in in being able to draw upon your experience in just writing nonfiction, but do you switch gears or when you're gang tackled by the muse, does it automatically put you in a different type of mindset? Or do you find that all of a sudden you're writing twenty pages and you read read it back and you think Actually, this sounds like a New York Times article as opposed to a piece of fiction. Well, it, you know, one of, one of the things that I think applies to both that has begun to get... F- <laughs> uh, has begun to get fused for me is a recognition that um, readers and writers have pretty short attention spans these days. And you have to write to keep people's attention. And so... More, more and more, I recognize this more and more in a blogosphere as well, I have to really be writing very precisely. I think the gap that once would have existed between those two has narrowed, at least for me. I think for probably someone who writes, quote-unquote, serious literature, it would be a much wider gap. 
That's part of the answer. Um, the other answer is it's very freeing to write this, to write this way. When you write for the Times, when you write as a journalist anywhere, um, you are so, you really it is fundamentally an analytical experience. That's the part of your brain that's being tapped into. You can't you can't screw up. Um, you can't misquote someone. Your analysis has to be very very profound and particular and well thought out, and you're in a box. So when I get to pick this up, it's, it's a little bit more of a playground. There are no strictures. There are no rules. Um, it's like uh, it's a little bit gluttonous. It's dessert. Questions? Um, shall I feed you some questions? Sunny. So when you're um, putting together a thriller and you're told to stay away from cliches, what um, sort of, how did you build that, well, uh, that sort of that, the meter on what was a cliche and not a cliche because most thrillers inherently depend on the cliche? One of the, uh, one of the things that, one, I think one of the critical things is your main, your protagonist can't do everything cannot slug fist through cement, cannot um, add a whole bunch of columns at one time in his or her head. You've got to have a protagonist that whose particular skills, in this case, the protagonist is a medical journalist having been to medical school, has some skills pertinent to solving a problem that come into play later. I think, for me, I have trouble suspending disbelief when the main character knows karate and can also, you know, build an incredible three-layer cake. I'm just not buying it at that point. So I think one is to base it in real character. The other is to base it in, to ground it in a, a plot that structure that someone might not have seen before. And while this is certainly not unseen, you do not know what happens in this book what has happened in this book until the last page. So what we tried to do was keep away any ending that you may have read a bunch of times before and build in two layers. There's two layers in this book and they don't fuse until the end. So one was character, one was plot. And the last thing is the editor said, and I'm so grateful for, because this is also something we try to try to adhere to in journalism is no words that have vague but big meaning. Don't say love. Uh, don't say handsome. Don't say beautiful. You've got to find something very particular to describe that. And not just a particular wording, but a particular character, how, how that trait might be particular to the character. I'll read just one very brief passage to illustrate how we tried to describe some, I tried to describe someone's character. I'm, I'll, write, I'll read two. Um, this is right after the explosion and our protagonist is sitting in the rubble. He's just read this note that he believes to be from his ex dead girlfriend. Can you move your legs? The words came through my fog from a police officer kneeling beside me. I waved my hand to say, I'm fine. I started to stand and he helped guide me up by the elbow. We need to get you out of this area. As my awareness returned, so did the sounds and colors in the chaos. Police and firefighters, the sound of radio chatter, helicopters. I was embedded in the evening news. The officer led me toward an area apparently being set up for the wounded. Was I hurt worse than I thought? Mystic River, the police officer said. I looked at him in confusion. Good book, he added, but you really should invest in the hardback. It's a sign of a fully committed person. So in that case, this, this police officer becomes more prominent and he's got commitment issues. And to, we tried to illustrate that through by saying owning a hardback is a sign of commitment. Here's another officer who becomes, plays a role in this book. After, he's, after the explosion, he's asked to, um, to be, he needs to be interviewed by the police. There's a particular lieutenant there by the name of uh, Aravello. <clears throat> the Aravellos seem to have been conceived after their mother mated with the side of a mountain. 
Big bones holding big chests and the strong, meaty hands that make politicians. Maybe that's why I fixated on the one small thing, the lieutenant's disproportionately small Adam's apple. It looked like a genetic hiccup. Dodo, he said. I found him staring intently at me. I turned to Danny. The lieutenant's a habitual nicknamer, Danny said. It suggests intimacy, but he's really letting you know who's in control. That'll be all, Danny boy. Beat it, the lieutenant said without a hint of self-awareness. We can do without the surveillance. Danny's jaw tightened. He turned around and walked away, and Aravello pulled his chair nearer. The dodo bird, extinct, he said, like print journalists. You'll be killed off by the internet and its much more efficient means of distribution. In San Francisco, even the cops were fixated on business models, to say nothing of the double meaning of dodo. So um, that might be a good place to pause. You're, why are you killing off the newspaper industry? No. <laughs> um, so let me uh, see how, let me, yes. Um, you, you sort of mentioned on a number of examples that you and the editor sort of, you know, had to, or you were taking advice from him. Was that, was that ever frustrating or did you feel that that was like a hindrance or is that more of a, you know, a help in, in writing a first book? It, for, for me, it was a, for me, it was a big help. Um, I think, uh, if it was journalism, I look at editors now as sometimes being hindrances because I think I know what I'm doing rightly or wrongly. Writing a first book it was a big help to have a Sherpa. And not just him, but my agent, who was a really talented woman as well. And li listen to what, they, what he did. I, here's how I figured out how long a book was. When I got started writing about 50 pages in, I thought, how long's a book? I went and I started counting the number of words on a page that were in books that I found at the bookstore, and then multiplying it by the number of pages, and then I knew, well, it's roughly 100,000 words. So I wrote 100,000 words. I kind of paced myself. He took 100,000 words, and he stripped it down to 65,000. He pulled out all the cliches, all the places where I didn't express them something in, in a creative way, and I looked at it a little bit like clearing out all the walls and furniture in your house, and he said, okay, now you can go build this book back, but everything you have to you put back in has to be interesting capital I. If it's not, if it's something I've heard before, if it's an observation about the San Francisco and the Valley I've heard before, if it's an observation about love, if the relationship between the main character and his ex possibly dead mate um, sounds like something I've heard before is not going in the book. Now, I do want to say, um, my wife often tells me, you know, stop giving the editor all the credit. So uh, the editor did a, a good job and a helpful job, but, you know, it, he basically helped set me in the right direction, and then it was my job to go march that way. Yes, helpful, um, and I, probably as I get better, I'll need different kinds of editors involved. As far as location and, and um, writing about the Bay Area, were there some areas that you weren't as familiar with that you picked? For example, Nat lives on Potrero Hill, and then he meets Annie up in uh, on Kings Beach, up at up at Tahoe. Were you were you familiar with Kings Beach, or did you think, oh, they could meet up in Napa Valley? But you went with the familiar as opposed to trying to investigate a bit. I was uh, I was at Kings Beach when I wrote that and hadn't been there before. This is up near Tahoe. And when you start writing this stuff, this material, you start seeing everything as a possible setting and everyone as a possible character and everything they do as a possible character trait. So you're, the, the experience you're living with, this fictional world, starts to get fused with the real one. And places that I'd never been before started to really get evocative in my imagination and then I could transport them in. One of the things you learn about in journalism is it only takes you a little bit of detail to paint a picture. You have very few words. So I could be at a place like Kings Beach or in Potrero where I don't live and make some observations and lend a kind of 
faux authority to whether or not, you know, to that place, even though I didn't live there. So I think, uh, I think in some ways, not being in a place all that often gives you an opportunity to write about it with fresh eyes. And you might say things, you might write, I, there's, there's a, when Woody Allen once came and did something about Los Angeles, everyone else had written about sushi and yoga and everything else, but somehow his fresh eyes allowed him to write about it in, well, and also his remarkable talent, which um, is just like what you'll find in Haunt. <laughs> So is there an actual cafe that you had in mind, or, or is there one in the marina for this cafe? or The was cafe it is the Grove that blew up. You guys know the Grove? In the first. So this actually, that scene where the cafe in, in the marina blows up can validate your conflicted feelings about the, the marina. Do I want it to blow up? Am I not sure? What about just a small explosion where no one gets hurt? What if it all exploded, but the mac and cheese was okay? Would I be all right with that? I know who you are. <laughs> um, you know, I could pause there unless there's more questions. And yes. How did you find balancing sort of the, you have a full, uh, your day job. How do you find carving time out for that? You said you have to get it in by three. So I presume you could do your book writing after three. But did you find it difficult to set time aside for your real work when you got really involved in this? You know, it's, it's the strangest thing, but I had a, a heavily productive time at the New York Times while I was writing. And, all, and the only way I can rationalize that or make sense of it is that my brain was on complete overdrive. And I don't think it's something that I could tap into for a longer period of time. Concretely, I got up at 6 in the morning and I wrote for two hours and then I did my day job, and the days when I had more energy, um, I got heavily, heavily into hot chocolates, which are my uh, about three or four in the afternoon, and I might write again from five to 6.30. It was just a, I'm sure you have those periods where you're completely in a zone. And I could sustain it for the five month period that it took to do this book, but I can't imagine sustaining it for a, a much longer period than that. Hi, thanks for coming. I'm curious if you looked at alternative channels for writing. So, for example, Amazon had an amateur novelist competition, and maybe another example would be a web based, you know, ebook or some other type where you have more freedom. You don't have the editor, although you said he was helping you, kind of looking over your shoulder and guiding you so much, and you could kind of do your own thing and innovate as a first time writer. Um, that is starting to happen for me. Just to go back before I come to that, I, I, I've been a huge reader all my life, and I guess I never really had a goal of writing a book, but once I started it, I liked, I liked this format, I liked this medium, I like sitting in bed reading a book, sitting on an airplane reading a book, so I'm a little bit in love with the medium, and I sought, I sought to do that, but subsequently, and re recognizing how hard it is to get a book published, even having done one, um, and even one that was this one was well received and was a bestseller in some markets. Who knows if I'll be capable again? It's a really, really tough market. Um, and so I've started to explore that. And in fact, this week, um, last week, I started to write um, a thriller on Twitter. So I am sending, uh, I, I have about 100 people following me, and I think another dozen or so have started following. I had to pause from my second novel to work on the marketing of this. And a lot of my creative energy has been frenetic and haven't known where to put it. So I'm now writing, uh, there's a guy, 140 characters at a time. It's all I'm allowed to write. A guy is wakes up with amnesia high in the mountains of Colorado and a tiny pin stuck between his two, his, his big toe and the toe next to it and wrapped around it is the name Abraham. And that's how it starts. And uh, I don't really know. <laughs> you can't see, on camera, you can't see this, but people are grimacing in pain. And uh, so now I'm starting to take advantage of all these other opportunities that let you write more quickly or be less vetted um, or reach a smaller audience or have a lower bar than 
you might have in a place where these, these books take a lot of investment, marketing dollars, publication dollars, editing dollars. A Twitter thriller, just, you know, I can write it until all 120 people evaporate out of anger. <laughs> Anything else? Well, you'll be able to stick around for some book signing. I'd be honored. And if people want to know more, they can obviously follow on the journalistic side in the New York Times, and then your um, uh, cartoonist or your cartoon side of things is available both through MattRichtel.com as well as it's uh, syndicated on a number of different spots. It's called Rudy Park. Rudy Park. That's correct. And any other things to share if people want to follow your whereabouts? Uh, Matt Richtel, M-A-T-T-R-I-C-H-T-E-L dot com. Great. Well, so thanks so much you can for... See, uh, you can see how I look airbrushed. <laughs> thanks so much for taking part.